what is the arrow of time? It's the simple fact that the past is different from the future, right? If you were an astronaut in your spacesuit, far up in orbit, far away from everything else, there would be no arrow of space. All the directions you can point in would be equally good. You wouldn't even notice. You wouldn't be able to say I was facing up or facing down. But not, obviously that's not true for time. Everyone agrees on which direction of time is yesterday and which direction is tomorrow. Uh, for example, we can remember things that happened yesterday. None of us can remember things that happen tomorrow, even though things will happen. So there's a million ways in which one direction of time, moving toward the past, looks different to us than the other direction, moving to the future. And that directedness from past to future is the arrow of time. This is a great example of a problem that only exists because you learn a little bit. You didn't think that it was a problem. You don't, you don't see Aristotle or Descartes worrying about the arrow of time, right? Well, what happens is we developed some notion of the fundamental laws of physics, starting with Galileo and Newton and working up through Maxwell and Einstein and others. There's a feature of Newton's laws, for example, which is that they don't have an arrow of time. They treat directionality toward the future and directionality toward the past exactly the same. One way of saying it is if you, if you make a movie of uh, an egg breaking and being scrambled, and you play it backwards. It's obvious that you're playing it backwards, right? You notice it, that's the arrow of time. You can notice when someone reverses it. But when you make a movie of a pendulum swinging back and forth, a very simple system, or you made a movie of the Earth going around the sun, another very simple system, if you played those backward, you wouldn't be able to tell that they were reversed. And that's because when you have a small number of pieces, fundamental physics without dissipation and friction and noise and all that stuff, there isn't any arrow of time. So the, the puzzle that we need to explain is how to reconcile the absence of an arrow at the microscopic fundamental level with the obvious presence of the arrow in our everyday lives. But with that pendulum in the earth, you say there wasn't an arrow. There was an arrow, it just, it just wasn't obvious. It was just harder to see because of the visual properties of the system, wasn't it? No, if you, if you look at the mm. equations, uh, look at the equations for the Earth going around the Sun. They're reversible, right? If you take the Earth, put it in the same position, but reverse its velocity, it will exactly retrace the path that it took. So the fundamental laws of physics have this property that, that, that for every way that you can evolve forward in time, there is an exactly corresponding way that you can evolve, uh, evolve backward in time. Uh, the macroscopic world is irreversible. You can take the egg and you can scramble it, but you can't unscramble the egg very easily. Or to put it this way, if you come across a, a cool glass of water, it might have been that 10 minutes ago it was a cool glass of water, or it might have been a warm glass of water with an ice cube in it. You can't tell the difference from the present state of the system. Whereas Newton's laws say that if you know the present state of the system, you can always uniquely tell us where it came from. But with your glass of ice water or your scrambled egg, why is it not the case that it is reversible, just our feeble minds couldn't possibly come up with the complex equations? Well, it is at some level. So if when you looked at the glass of water, instead of seeing water, you saw with your eyeballs the position and velocity of every water molecule, and your brain was good enough to do the calculation, then you could reverse it. And that is the secret to reconciling the microscopic reversibility to the macroscopic irreversibility. Namely that in the macroscopic world, we don't see everything. We only see some coarse-grained features of reality. When we have the air in this room, we don't see the position and velocity of every air molecule. And it turns out that in that coarse-grained description of reality, the past is very, very different from the future. And the way that we characterize this is by entropy. Of course, entropy is the way the physicists talk about the disorderliness, the messiness, the chaoticness of the macroscopic universe. And there's a, a law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, very famous, says that entropy increases toward the future. That's easy to understand, actually. Getting messier is a very natural thing. The hard thing to understand is that entropy was lower in the past. <laughs> That's the same statement as entropy increasing toward the future. But there's no easy dynamical principle of physics that would explain why the entropy was ever low. In particular, in the real world, it was low 13.7 billion years ago near the Big Bang. Our, our observable universe started in a state of exquisite order. 
And then ever since it's been expanding and cooling and disorderliness has come into being. So really it becomes a cosmology question. We understand the equations behind the arrow of time. What we don't understand is why it was ever put into the universe at the Big Bang. Does time flow just in one direction like a river then? Or are, are you saying it is going both ways? Well, time flowing has always been a somewhat dicey kind of simile or metaphor because flowing means changing with time. <laughs> and time doesn't change with time. We, when we speak about time, uh, we don't use very precise language very often. But uh, I think you know, an accurate way of saying the same question is, does time truly have a directionality? Or at the fundamental level, are both directions of time on an equal footing? I would say that at the fundamental level, both directions of time are equal. That when we uh, observe the arrow of time in our real world, it's just like the arrow of space here on Earth. Remember when we did the analogy for the astronaut, we had to go up into orbit far away from the Earth. Here, on the surface, there's a difference between up and down. I should say down and up, right? Why is there that difference? Well, because we are in the vicinity of a very influential object, the Earth. That's what gives space its arrow locally. What I'm saying is that the reason why there's an arrow of time is precisely analogous. There's an arrow of time in our environment because we are in the vicinity of a very influential event, the Big Bang. There's two kinds of questions that uh, arise here. One is a good kind of question, one is a not so good kind of question. The not so good kind of question is there are many, many people out there who just deny the fact that the origin of the arrow of time is the fact that our early universe had a low entropy. Uh, there were debates that went on from the 19th century, from the you know, 1870s with Boltzmann and Maxwell and Gibbs and Loschmidt and Zermelo and others trying to figure out how to reconcile microscopic reversibility with macroscopic irreversibility. And they sort of solved the problem halfway. They said, if you have a low entropy condition long ago, then entropy increases and everything follows. What they didn't do is explain to us why we had a low entropy boundary condition very long ago. Modern cosmology says, you know, we can blame it on the Big Bang. It doesn't solve the problem, right? It just puts it off to the Big Bang. But we don't mention the Big Bang when we teach people thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, because that's all about predicting the future. It's not about retrodicting the past. So many people, including people who know a lot of physics, don't get that you need to put a boundary condition at the Big Bang to understand the arrow of time. Those people are just incorrect. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, well, if you do want to explain why the early universe had a low entropy, what's the right explanation? Does inflationary cosmology already explain it? Does Stephen Hawking's wave function of the universe already explain it? Do you need a multiverse to explain it? Should you just accept it as a brute fact and not look for explanations? These are very good questions. These are all viable alternatives on the table, and it's part and parcel of what we discuss in modern cosmology. You live on Earth as a human. You I do. Had, you had to be here at 3 o'clock. You've got to be on your plane tomorrow. Time rules your life as a human. When you think about time as much as you do on this higher plane, does it affect your everyday life? Do, you, does, do all these times that somehow seem irrelevant or are the two very separate parts of your personality? Well, I think that the way that we human beings very correctly perceive the world is a multi-leveled way. Uh, and especially if you're a working physicist, you better think this way. Uh, you know, you don't need to use the standard model of particle physics to scramble your egg. That would make life very, very difficult indeed. So we have different kinds of vocabularies. We have this fundamental vocabulary of particle physics and quantum mechanics and relativity. And then this higher level vocabulary of thermodynamics and fluids and, and objects and solids. And an even higher level vocabulary of human beings and their wants and desires and aspirations and thoughts and rational reasons and so forth. So they all fit together. There are connections between the different levels. And it's all one consistent story, I believe. We haven't figured out all the details of that consistent story. But I get just as anxious when I'm running late as anyone who doesn't know anything whatsoever about the arrow of time. The Higgs boson is a tiny little vibration in a field called the Higgs field. Just